If you're winning, it's your fault. If you're losing, it's also your fault. If you're fat, it's your fault. Okay. Wealthy, it's your fault. If you're broke, it's your fault. There's no longer an excuse to not be successful. And everybody has that same opportunity to be legendary. It's what are you willing to sacrifice in order to get there? Like you have to be put in a situation, experience it, come out on the other side to grow mentally. What would you say is like the core message to what you want people to just really understand about mental toughness? Ultimately, the greatest gift for anybody is to what up, Wealth Builders? Today, I got a treat for you. This guy is one of the toughest dudes I've ever heard about. He has done 50 Ironmans in 50 days in 50 states. And if that wasn't enough, he was like, you know what? I'm going to one-up it. During the pandemic, he just decided to do 100 of them in a row. And I think he did it with a broken back for half of them. So it's unbelievable the mental toughness this guy has. And I want to pick his brain on how exactly you can build that type of mental toughness for your life, for your business, how you're going through any struggles. I've got none other than James Lawrence, AKA the Iron Cowboy. What's up? What's up, buddy? I'm glad we finally got to do this. Uh, we've been talking for a little bit, but dude, I just like getting people on who are not soft. That's my number one agenda. Yeah. Oh, good. <laughs> and then, then you pick the right guy today. Yeah. Because whenever I hear about guys doing really hard things, I'm like, here we go, baby. This guy gets it. Yeah, it's interesting. As I've traveled around the world, I've now spoken in uh, 56 countries, which is crazy to me. Yeah. Um, and every time I get off stage, the number one question I get is, how do I become more mentally tough? Right. And so it became this theme of people wanting to figure that out. Yeah. And uh, it, it took me a moment, but then I recognized as I looked back on my career and had met many conversations and deep dives, it's only through experience it's only through experiences. Like you have to be put in a situation, experience it, come out on the other side to grow mentally. And we, we were kind of in a unique time of consumption where everybody's uh, reading books, listening to podcasts, watching social media, waiting to grow. And there's so much information and not enough action. Mm -hmm. And so people are just sitting at home waiting for, change and, mm. it's, and it's not coming yeah you know i tell people that all the time it's like everyone's perspective on life is dictated by their experiences that's yeah. literally how you create perspective you, you don't get perspective by listening to me talk about something and you're like yeah i agree with ryan it's like bro you don't even know what i'm talking about <laughs> you don't <laughs> unless yeah. you actually have gone through it and then you resonate you're like dude yes i remember when this happened to me that's exactly how i was feeling yeah it's so interesting um What's there, 8 billion, 8 billion people in the world? Yeah. On the planet walking around, bumping into each other. And uh, it, it's fascinating because we're sitting in a space where there's eight, 8 billion different perspectives. <laughs> and everybody's looking through their own unique lens at life. Yeah. And there's a lot of me too's and copycats and just listening to information and, and getting that opinion. But the way that our brains are wired, it's based off of the environments that we grew up in. Mm -hmm. And until we go start having those experiences where we, where we will truly form our own unique lens to look through and, the, and, and ultimately that's what will shape our perspective. Yeah. Because your experiences are very different than mine. Now we're both sitting here in the same space in the same time having a conversation, mm -hmm. but how we got here was very, very different. Yeah. And that's ultimately how you gain knowledge and experience by doing hard things and showing up and putting in the work. And then at some point in time, you look to your left and when you're in a difficult situation and go, okay, I can pull from this experience. I can pull from this experience in order to navigate what's happening right here. Yeah. No, I love that. And I definitely want to dive in your story about how, like what even pushed you to, to do all these things and everything else. But, you know, like uh, we were just training this new sales team on Saturday. So a couple of days ago, right after WealthCon, because uh, we are onboarding all these new guys. Right. And I'm like, you know what? I want to set the standard differently this time around. You know, for years, we've had all these sales guys come through. And in my mind, I've always been like, these guys are so soft. Like, it just is what it is. <laughs> That's my perspective. I'm like, the leads are amazing. You don't have to go and cold call and door knock and all this crap that other salespeople have to do. Like, you just get to sit on a computer and, and try and close, right? So my perspective is, this is the easiest sell ever, right? 
And my perspective is shaped because I flipped a hundred or a thousand couches, you know, like literally going in apartments, negotiating deals and picking these things up just to make a hundred (laughs) bucks. You know, these guys can make thousands in commissions. You literally flipped couches. Yeah. I literally flipped couches because I didn't have any way of making money. So I negotiated all these couch flips on Craigslist, just picking up couches for years. Okay. This, this is, I love, I love that. Mm -hmm. So much because everybody's walking around with excuses of, I can't do this. I I can't figure this out. I can't make any money. There's no opportunities. And man, that is so beautiful because in life you create your own opportunities and you're going to get back what you give. What you give is what you're going to get back. The right energy is universal and whatever you put out there comes back. The fact that you created, and that's where your journey started was flipping, literally flipping Yeah, that was my entrepreneurial journey. Yeah. That is so wild. <laughs> I love I love you for that, man. Yeah, that's a crazy story. But yeah, it, nobody was going to do it for me. So I'm like, I'm going to have to figure out how to make money myself, yeah. right? There, like YouTube and TikTok and stuff wasn't big back then. So you just had to like figure it out. It was so funny when I first started uh, doing these big challenges. Um, do, do you remember Periscope? Yeah. On Twitter? Yep, yep. Yeah, that was the only live thing at the time is when we started that. And so, yeah, social media has completely changed the game. And with social media and the internet, and and there's no longer an excuse to not be successful. Agreed. You, you're absolutely getting in. It, it's it's your fault. And I love, the, I love the whole accountability, look in the mirror. If you're winning, it's your fault. If you're losing, it's your fault. Mm-hmm. Um, because we live in such a remarkable time. Um, it, you you can either choose to allow social media and the internet to cripple you or freeze you just because you're consuming all the time, or you can turn it into an opportunity. There's, there's no longer a barrier of entry to education, yep. information. You just have to take that and apply it. It's so funny because everyone's like, I, I don't have access. And I'm like, I've been in the poorest of countries, uh, racing and speaking. And even in those countries, they all have smartphones. They yeah. will be homeless and no food, but they have a smartphone yeah. that's connected to the World Wide Web. And so there's no longer any reason to not and be definitely successful. Not if, not if you're in America. That's for sure. Oh, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> so, but yeah, like. Because you, you're from the Philippines. Well, I'm from here. My dad's from the Philippines. Yeah. Okay. So he, he came here uh, when he was 17. Okay. So yeah, I've been privileged. And, um, you know, I'll say this, like, and I told the salespeople because you just brought it up with accountability. I go, hey, up to this point, I have never trained salespeople. I've always relied on other people to do it. And therefore, I take responsibility that you don't understand what my level of standards are for a great salesperson. And I go, I've sold a million dollars in 10 minutes. I've sold from stage. I've sold on webinars. I've sold in living rooms. I've sold multi-million dollar deals, you know, real estate, hundred million dollar plus of real estate deals. I've had to transact and negotiate like my perspective on sales is very different on what's a good salesperson look like than maybe you guys think. You know, you might come in here thinking you're a big dog because you've made $100,000, you know, selling something or as a realtor. I think you suck. And that's what I told him. I go, <laughs> yeah. my perspective is you suck if you think $100,000 is a good salesperson. And I go, you know, how many of you guys have made a million dollars in a year selling stuff? And it was only me and Brian Davila, my partner, who could raise their hand. And I said, Look at Brian's journey. This dude cold called for 48 hours a day, 48 hours per day for five years straight. That's why he can sell and you can't because he's put in the work. He's had the reps, the experience. He was, um, he had no dad. He had a kid when he was a teenager. He had a single mom. Like this dude understands what hard looks like. And then I said, you know, how many of you guys have made half a million? A couple raised their hand. I said, how many of you guys have made over 300,000? You know, there was like five people. And I go, great. I would consider you guys, based on my experience and perspective, to be good salespeople if you've achieved that result. If you haven't, you're not good. And that's just how I see it. Now, everybody has a different perspective. You know, if you're playing Little League baseball, you know, you're not in the big leagues yet, right? But for me, it's like, yo, I didn't get to the big league, so I wasn't good enough. That's just my perspective. I was just in your office. I saw you in an in an A's. Yeah. Yeah. I got drafted by the A's and I played in the minors for many years, but I didn't get to the big leagues. Okay. So yeah, I'm better than 99% of the world, yeah. but I wasn't good in my eyes of like, yo, that was where I needed to be. And I didn't get there. Yeah. There's, there's a, uh, there's good, there's great. And then there's legendary. Exactly. And every journey has that beginning point and everybody has that same opportunity to be legendary. 
It's what are you willing to sacrifice in order to get there? People ask me all the time, hey, what's next for you? What are you going to do? And I'm at the point now where I have a belief that anything is possible. Mm -hmm. But I always have to ask myself two questions. What's the sacrifice it's going to take to achieve it? And what's the benefit to myself, my family, and my community? And if I can't make those two things line up, mm. I'm not doing it. Bro, I like where your mindset's at. And so you really have to decide what's worth it, what you want to do. And it's it's crazy. As I even age now, I'm, I'm, I'm coming close to 50, which is mind-blowing to me because I don't feel like it. Um, I, I still believe my greatest athletic endeavors or pursuits are still in me. Mm. And I have multiple world records and I'm in it. I'm, I'm one of, I'm one of 8 billion in what we, I've been able to accomplish. Yeah. And so to have that mindset that I believe the best is still in me. Wow. I think is, is, is a gift to be able to think that way. And it's ultimately the goal in life is to be able to get out of your own way to pursue whatever you want yeah. and to have that limitless mindset. And I, and I live in that space every single day. Yeah. I don't believe there's nothing I can achieve. I, I believe I could reach your level in real estate if I wanted to. I love that. But I I don't have any interest in it, right? Dude, we have the exact same mentality. I I believe I can be successful in whatever I choose to want to be successful in. 1000%. And you you just reframed a different way of something I always say it's that the purpose has to exceed the cost. Mm. And so you said it of like what's the benefit to me in this? What's the purpose? Why am I even doing this, right? Yeah. Is the purpose so strong that I'm willing to pay the cost to get there? And so for your in this example of real estate, you're like, no, I don't really care about real estate. Like <laughs> it's not worth the cost of trying to go learn this thing. Right. And uh, so you won't do it. And I tell people that whenever they're thinking about trying to go into real estate or business or create content, I'm like, why are you doing it? You don't have a good enough reason. You ain't going to, you ain't going to go through all the hard times. Yeah. I, this is a topic that I love. And it's a, uh, that, that in that vein of the reason you're doing something and ultimately people don't attach a high enough significant or emotional value to it. Mm -hmm. And that's why they fail. Yes. And when you get back in, into a corner, when it's difficult and it's dark and you're isolated and you're alone and anxiety is coming in and depression, what's your reason or motivation to get up out of that corner and to now pursue whatever it was you were doing? And this is something that I, I love to call a bag of wise. And what that means is you have to be armed with an insane amount of different reasons that are emotionally charged in order to get out of that moment. Because when you are backed into that corner, dark, isolated, alone, broken, your one reason isn't going to be enough. Mm -hmm. And it's going to keep you in that corner by yourself. And then you're going to, you're going to, you're going to spiral out of control and hit rock bottom. Yeah. And at some point in time, you got to reach into that bag and start pulling out multiple different reasons why I start stacking them. And now I call it purpose. Now you've got a purpose to keep going because yeah, you've, you've purpose, tied it to something bigger. Your purpose is just a, you know, bunch of stacked up whys yes. for doing something. Yeah. Yeah. Wealth builders, if you're finally ready to get off the fence and start investing in real estate or scale your business, now is the time. Interest rates are projected to drop multiple times this year which means prices are gonna go up and it is a great time to flip houses, to wholesale, and to start buying again. So if you're trying to get that first deal or you're trying to scale to the next level, we wanna help you out. Make sure you go to wealthyinvestor.com. You can book a free call with our team today to see which program can help you get to the next level. We can partner with you and help you get that first deal. We'll even close the deal for you or we can teach you how to build your business, how to build a company, how to start hiring people. It does not matter which stage of the game you're at. We want to help you out. So go to wealthyinvestor.com and see us today. No, I love that. So what was your purpose for even getting into the Ironmans? Okay. Yeah. So um, I moved from Canada to Utah. What part of Canada? Calgary, Alberta. Okay. Yes. Um, actually, real quick story. Calgary's world famous for uh, what's called the, the flames. <laughs> nope. We have one. We have once we have the same amount of Stanley cups as Vegas. <laughs> and we've been in the game for a lot longer. I actually remember the I was a huge hockey fan growing up. Um, wasn't a great skater. but I played a ton of street hockey. Um, three sisters, no brothers. Parents couldn't name probably five big sports figures. And so sports was not in there. I had to find it and it became my life. I love sports, did all of it. Um, 
but I, I was I was about 12 years old uh, when Calgary finally won their first and only Stanley Cup in 1988-89 season. And so I still hold on to that. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. I've, I've recently become uh, more of a Vegas fan because it's close. I can drive five hours, catch a game. Yeah. Um, it's a ton of fun. That stadium's wild. Yep. Um, but I grew up in Canada, grew up a wrestler, played all sports. Um, Calgary's world famous for the Calgary Stampede. Got it. It's one of the largest rodeos in the entire world. The city shuts down 10 days. And I was kind of in my early 20s trying to figure out life. And uh, there was a radio show that announced this contest. And they said, we want to find out who can ride the giant Ferris wheel for the entire 10 days of the stampede. <laughs> and they put up this cash prize. <laughs> and so I was like, man, I, I think I can do that. And so uh, I called the radio station when the right song played. And I was, I was one caller off mm. to get on the ride. And they said, well, we'll put you as an alternate. And I was like, okay, cool. Night before the stampede starts, I get a phone call. They're like, someone just dropped out. Do you want to go on the ride? And I was like, yes. And so I got on the ride, long story short, I sat on the Ferris wheel for 10 days, <laughs> learned for the first time at a very high level, control of your mind is everything. Yeah. Because about halfway through, I was watching people get off and I couldn't figure out why they were quitting. Oh. And it was ultimately because they weren't comfortable with the conversations they were having with themselves. Mm. And one of the goals in life is to give ourselves, forgive ourselves for our past so that we can forge a new future. But our past is typically what's holding us back. And it's the loop and the conversations that we're having with ourselves about our past. And so as these people were exiting the ride, I was like, man, they're just not okay with who they are. This was pre-social media, pre-phones. The objective of the contest was complete boredom. How can you control your minds and your thoughts? Did you have food and stuff? Nope. You no had, food. You had two 10 minute breaks a day to, to eat go to the bathroom and go to the bathroom. Got it. And so you had to not eat enough. You had to not eat a lot so that you didn't have to go to the bathroom. Right. This whole balancing point. So that was part of, to me, looking back on it now, it was really a, a test of mental fortitude. Yes. Can you control your environment? Can you control your thoughts? Can you control your urges to eat? Can you, you know, all these things that you had to control. So it was really a mindset challenge and they didn't design it that way, but that's what it ended up being. And, um, and so that, that I got off the, I won the contest, got off the Ferris wheel, won, won a bunch of money. How much did you make? 10 grand. Okay. So a thousand bucks. How a old were you? Uh, it was, I was 20, 22. Yeah. That's a lot of money, man. Dude, tons of money. I was working <laughs> at a golf course, making seven bucks an hour, picking up balls. you right. <laughs> Are you a golfer too? Oh, huge. Yeah. Oh, dude, I'm a golfer. We'll have to play. I know. I saw that. I just played uh, Black Desert yesterday. We might have some time in, this afternoon. In St. George. You, you never know. Yeah, I have my clubs. Um, and so I got off the Ferris wheel, had a friend in Utah, hitchhiked, literally hitchhiked a ride from Calgary to Utah. Then I met my wife. Um, we just celebrated 23 years of marriage. We've got five kids. And um, I was an athlete growing up. And so was, uh, so was my wife. And she was like, hey, let's do this four mile fun run. And I was like, oh, I'm not really a runner. I'm more of a gym goer. And she's like, oh, just come do it. And anyways, I struggled through this four mile fun run, like struggled. Yeah. And it was Thanksgiving. We go to dinner. I'm like, I've got that like cough from running, uh, exhausted, really pathetic. <laughs> and, uh, and my wife told me I was pathetic. <laughs> and then she said, I just signed you up for the Salt Lake city marathon, figure it out. It's in four months. Whoa. And I was like, Whoa, that's a big jump. But she, my wife's so smart. She was like, okay, that, that nearly broke you physically and mentally. I'm going to put a challenge on the table so big that you have to figure it out. She, has she just always challenged you? Yes. In your relationship? Yeah, okay. huge. And and we, we've we really grown up together. She was 19 when we got married. I was 24. So just babies. Yeah. And then we started having babies right away. Right. And so I struggled through this form of fun run. She signed me up for a marathon. And I remember that night after the marathon, like I, it was terrible. I, my, my knee swelled up. Um, I, I threw up at the finish line, but I had tickets to the MMA fights in Salt Lake City that night. And so I go to the fights. I sit in this, in my seat and I refuse to move all night because I was so pissed about this marathon. And uh, the night ends and I go to try to stand up and I can't. <laughs> My knees were so swollen. I literally had to have a wheelchair wheeled into the stadium to get me out to my car. That had to be a low point. Holy cow. Like yeah. you talk about a defining moment. You're in the machoist of environments. Mm -hmm. You're a grown man and you 
can't stand up because you failed running. Like th that's a pathetic scenario. Yeah. And you know, a lot of people see the headline now and they're like, Oh, this guy's genetically different. He's gifted. And my journey started incredibly pathetic and very <laughs> humble, humble. <laughs> yeah. And, um, and so then I had a friend who was into triathlon. I, he invited me over. I watched Lance do the final stage of the tour de France and it was exhilarating. Yeah. And he challenged me to, to do this little sprint triathlon. And it's just an 800 meter swim. Didn't know how to swim. Tw a 12 mile bike. I borrowed a bike and then a 5k run. And I absolutely fell in love with that challenge. What made it different than just running just because it was so you know, diverse? I think the, I think the variety of it. Yeah. Um, and, and it was, it, you know, the marathon was too much for me at that part of my journey and it, it broke me down and it was kind of interesting because I had to make a decision in that point. I'm like, am, am I going to allow this moment to define me or am I going to break down why it was so difficult to overcome that? Mm -hmm. And a lot of people now they say, Oh, I don't run cause I have bad knees. And I'm like, you have bad knees because you don't run. Exactly. And everybody has knee pain when they start running because it's new. Yeah. And when you start doing anything new, one, you suck at it. Mm -hmm. And two, it's difficult and you're going to feel those aches and pains from it. Yeah. And then as you evolve and get better, you get stronger and you can do more and bigger things. And so I started doing triathlon, fell in love with it, loved the community. My wife and I were doing it together and um, ultimately saw the Ironman World Championships on TV. So she's a savage too. Dude, she's a beast. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and for the listeners that don't know, an Ironman distance triathlon is a 2.4 mile swim. It's a 112 mile bike ride so <laughs> over a century. And then it finishes with a full marathon run, 26.2 miles. So it's 140.6 miles. In we, one day. In one, yeah. One How day. long does it typically take? So the cut, time cutoff is 17 hours. Wow. And the fastest guys will do it around eight. And then you have all the way till, so it starts at 7 a.m. and you have to midnight to complete this challenge. NBC Sports calls it the most single difficult day in sports. What, which part do you think is the hardest? It's different for everybody, but me personally, it's the run. Um, only because you've already done so much. 114.4 miles leading up to that point. You're deep into the day. If you haven't prepped right, if you haven't got your nutrition right, if you start losing the conversations in your head, now that run becomes an insane challenge. And when you think about it, less than 1% of the population has done an, a marathon. Yeah. So you're in rare air if you do a, an Ironman distance. For me, uh, the, the swim scares me. Yes. You could die. A hundred percent. In fact, <laughs> two it, miles it, swimming, two point crazy, two and a half. Yeah. yeah. It, it's actually the biggest, biggest barrier for people to get in because there's this panic, this fear yeah. of drowning and dying. Yeah. And in fact, people die every single year in the swim of an Ironman. Yeah, I believe it. And, and it's, it's, it's kind of a combination of many things. It's, you definitely couldn't do the swim last. Right. That would be bad. That would be really bad. And that <laughs> that's why they designed it this way. Actually, the reason Ironman came, how it came to be was there was these three buddies in Hawaii and one of them was a swimmer. One of them was a biker and one of them was a runner. And they were having this argument of who's the best athlete. Mm. And so in Hawaii, there was this 2.4 mile race around this island that they would swim. And that was a standalone race. And then there was a race where they would bike 112 miles. And then there was obviously the marathon. And so they were like, well, let's just put all three together and we'll see who's the best athlete. And the first time they did it, it was like 1970s and it took they did it over two days. Yeah. And they're so funny pictures. It's like they're in jean cutoff shorts. And <laughs> just totally unprepared. Is just totally unprepared. <laughs> and anyways, that's wild, but it turned into this huge thing. Mm. And, and after I started getting into the sport, I saw the Ironman world championships on TV and I was like, what is this? And then just, they described those distances. And I was like, that's it. That's what I want to do. That's as big as I could think based off of the experience that I had had. Yeah. And, um, and like you said, I thought I was ready for that first Ironman swim. <laughs> I was not. And when you put 2000 athletes in the water and that gun goes off and that adrenaline from all those athletes is released, that water gets turned into a washing machine. Mm. And at my first race, I got kicked in the face. I got punched. I got swam over top. And there was a moment where I actually got pulled down into the water. 
Wow. Because it's so chaotic and there's so many athletes because you got to envision, right? You're bobbing up and down to start the race and everybody's like excited and talking. And then the gun goes off and you go from up and down to a prone position. And all of a sudden the space that you were once occupying is now no longer there and you're on top of each other. Yeah. And until you get into the race about 500 meters or so, it's, it's this washing machine Everybody's type environment. It's chaos. Yeah. And, and it's, it's actually a beautiful analogy for life because life is going to be chaotic and you have to figure out how to relax and calm yourself down in order to navigate those waters. Well, I think it's also a good point that everybody like kind of starts in the same position yes. and then you start to really separate as time yes. goes on. That's I've never actually thought of that. That's a great point. And so to you, you, you know, you, you said you're, you, you, you'd be most worried about the swim. Yeah. And what's interesting about swimming is it's not a strength sport. Correct. It, it's all technique. It's all technique. I have so many pictures of me getting out of the water with a, a very normal looking female that just smoked me. Mm -hmm. And I would, I would beat the crap out of her in a street fight, but she, she destroyed me in the water. And it's because it's all technique. It's, it's remaining calm. It's staying relaxed. And as soon as you can figure out how to do that, the swim simply becomes a formality. It's actually a warm up for the rest of the race. Yeah. And so I saw the Ironman World Championships, signed up for my first race, did it. And now my perspective changed and the lens that I see the sport changed. And I was like, that was incredible. I can do that better. And I started going down this journey of what is possible mind, body, and spirit for me, right? Because it's an individual sport. And um, at the time, I was, I, I came from another country with very little money in my pocket. I had, I knew one person and I was like, I have a chance to live the American dream. Mm -hmm. found my wife, got married, started having kids, started a business. I owned a mortgage company. I was going to say, how are you supporting yourself through all this? Okay. Yeah. I owned a mortgage company. Got so it. I was doing a lot of things. I'm an entrepreneur at heart, like hardcore. Um, and so I was doing everything I could. And Which so, one was your priority? If you had to say. Between? You know, training and being the best Ironman you could or the mortgage company. So for sure at that time, it was raising my supporting my family so with mortgage making sure that, that yeah because i i hated the industry i mean you you know being in real estate there's it's it's the most thankless job in the industry everybody thinks you're screwing them over <laughs> everybody thinks you're getting points on the back end <laughs> like it's impossible for someone to say oh man thank you for that great deal like it just doesn't exist and it's so terrible and anyways uh, as i was building this business i had an investment property i i just finished building my dream home i just moved we literally just moved in and then 08 hit mm -hmm. and uh we fought from 08 to 011, no, 011, from 08 to 11, um, just to survive. Yeah. And we ripped through our savings. We lost our, like, you remember the moment they come and knock on your door and take away your home. Wow. And I remember having to move out of the house and we, f we found this like 800 square foot place to live and I couldn't afford to turn the heat on. Wow. And I've got these five little kids and so I had this, this buddy whose dad worked in the coal mines in, uh, in Utah and in price Utah. And I said, Hey, I'm, I'm trying to sleep. Through, I'm trying to get good rest so that I can do whatever work I can to put food on the table, but I have to keep getting up in the night to put wood on the fire that my kids are sleeping in front of to keep them warm. Can you, can you go take some coal from the coal mines so that I can put it on the fire so it'll burn all night long so I can get some sleep? And so he he did that and we got coal and it 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 heated that little room that my kids were sleeping in in front of the fireplace um, so that I could get some sleep so I could do whatever odd, odd end jobs the next day um, to put food on the table. And I I've done... And I've done research and I, and I recognize that in serving others, um, it can take away some of our, our burdens mm -hmm. and distract us. And I was, I'd lost everything. I was at rock bottom and I was trying to figure out, okay, who, who can I serve and in what capacity? 
and still do something that, that I love, which was triathlon at the time. Yeah. And so I, I, I partnered with a charity that was building dams in Africa. And I, I said, okay, I, I think I'm capable enough to break the world record for the most half Ironmans in a single year. And I'll do it to raise money to, to build these dams in Africa. And so that, that's, that was a massive pivot point in my life to what put us ultimately on this path and ended up breaking that world record. And then I just started doing research and I'm like, okay, as my lens was changing based off of the experiences that I was having, I then tackled the Ironman world record for the most Ironmans in a single year. And the world record at the time was 20 races, official events around the world. And so I looked at it, I looked at it and I said, okay, I think I can do 30. And people were like, why not just do 21? <laughs> and I was like, because 21 would break the record, but I want to set a new standard. Yeah. And I think the problem in, in the world today is we're all walking around in comparison mode. Yeah. And we're comparing ourselves to what somebody else has, what somebody else is doing. Um, and we're limiting what's possible for us. Because sal you know, salary caps are meant for professional sports, not on our potential in life. And when you compare yourself to others, you're actually putting a ceiling on what's possible. Mm -hmm. And so I said, no, I'm going to do 30, ended up doing that, had a lot of amazing experiences, had tons of growth. Um, on that journey, ended up pulling um, on race 27 of 30 in that year after we were, had already broken the world record. I pulled a boy with cerebral palsy Whoa. through the entire Ironman. And uh, I wanted to give him the gift of, of that experience and finishing one. He couldn't do it on his own. Yeah. And that moment really changed my life because it was in that moment that I recognized that nothing great's ever accomplished on our own. Hmm. And life is meant to be lived in harmony with other people, helping other people be great and doing great things with each other. And I think we learned that at a high level through the pandemic and isolation. Like That's not who we are as humans. We're tribal. Yeah. And we need community and people and, and help to do things. Ultimately, we, we can't do it on our own. Yeah. And there's going to be obviously moments on our journey where it's like, okay, nobody's coming. <laughs> we talked about that earlier. No one's coming. I got to pull myself out of the corner. Um, but ultimately success happens at a high level. You, you don't have this by yourself. Right. You surround yourself with great people. Now you're the leader. Yeah. And you're bringing other people with you, but it magnifies you. Yeah. In what you're doing. We are launching our newest program over at Wealthy Business that is going to help change the game for businesses and help them scale with purpose. So what exactly does that mean? Well, we want to help you grow your business, but keep the main things, the main things in your life, the family, the faith, the health and everything that's important. We don't want to sacrifice that while we help you scale your business. And so we're going to give you the same tools that I use to continue to grow my businesses to new levels, but still having the time and financial freedom to do the things that are important to me. We're gonna teach you how we do marketing at a high level and generate leads for such low amounts. We're gonna teach you how we convert those leads into sales. We're gonna give you all the softwares we have. We're gonna show you how to build company culture and operations. We're gonna teach you how to make your offers even better. And we're gonna show you how to manage your finances so you know where your money's going and how you can get more to the bottom line. So if that sounds like something you want, go to wealthybusiness.com, book a call with our team today, and we will help you scale with purpose. So after the world record in 2012 and 30 Ironmans, um, there was a gentleman named Dean Carnassus. Have you ever heard of him? No. He's an ultra runner. He's been on Good Morning America. He was really the pioneer um, of my generation that was doing these big endurance challenges. And I was trying to figure out what was next for me after that, because once you reach a mountaintop per se, all of a sudden you can see a new one that you didn't know existed. Because again, we have different experiences and that lens is forever changing. Yeah. And so as I was standing there trying to figure out, okay, what's next for me? Um, this gentleman, Dean Carnassus, had done 50 marathons in 50 days through 50 states. And uh, I thought, man, he's, 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 created an entire career and life for him from that project. Mm. What would happen if I did that with an Ironman? And then obviously, you know, Ironman finishes with that, that marathon. So you can do an Ironman if you're really great shape, three, three and a half hours, right? So to do- That's crazy. Three and a half hours? Is that fast or slow? Um, to me, that's insanely fast. It is fast. So three and a half hours is an eight minute mile. 
Do you know what the world record is for the fastest marathon? What? Two hours and 35 seconds. It's insane. It's a 435 mile. <laughs> the general population, I'm going to say less than 1% of 1% could run one mile at a 435. Oh, yeah. No way. It was just broken. Um, I was actually at the race that it was broken at. It was in Chicago. Um, I was I was guiding I was guiding this young man named Chris Nickich. Um, he has Down syndrome. Mm-hmm. And he's uh, Down syndrome is such a to me, it's a, such a gift to to watch someone with Down syndrome because they just have pure joy. Mm-hmm. That they they're it's just the purest of of a person. Yeah. Um and anyways, this this dad, Chris, no, Nick. Nick's the dad, Chris is the kid. They watched our documentary from the 50. And this kid, Chris, says, Man, if if that guy can do 50, I can do one. Mm. And so he ended up being the first person with Down syndrome to do a full Ironman. Wow. And then he was going to break the world record to do what's called the World Marathon Series. So Tokyo, London, Berlin, Chicago, Boston, New York. He was going to be the first one to do all six of those in one year. And But he needs a guide to keep him on track. Right, right. He gets distracted. <laughs> yeah. He, he loves... Um, he loves girls and Chipotle burritos. <laughs> <laughs> How old is he? Uh, he's first 25 now. That's funny. And so I, I, I had him on my podcast, found out that it was our, our journey that kickstarted his. And so it was an honor to go to Chicago where this record for the marathon was broken. And I got to guide Chris through it yeah. at the same time that the world record was happening. So, so many things were happening at the same time. And, um, and so after the 50, I'm sorry. After the the 30, I I saw Dean Carnassus, what would be possible if I did it with an Ironman. And so I started on that journey and I I started to figure it out. And again, we had those little kids and I was, I was, I now shifted from losing everything, not allowing that to be my story, banding arms with my wife and saying, we're going to create whatever we want. And it's going to be massive, but we don't know how big it's going to be. We don't know what the path looks like, but we're just going to show up and trust the process. Yeah. And ended up starting to put together those 50 and um, crazy story. There's a, you can watch the documentary on Amazon prime. We have a book called redefine impossible um, that's available. And we just started on this journey, piled all five kids into a motor home and started to go around the country. Mm. And every single day we did an Ironman in, in a new, new um, state. So we started in Hawaii, flew to Alaska, flew to Washington. Then we piled into the motor home and started to navi- yeah. navigate the lower 48. And it ended up being complete chaos. Um, new, new environment every single day. Getting new, late to places. New challenges. Yep. I mean, yeah. we, we destroyed the motor home in the middle of the night. We, we, we hit a deer, fried the generator, Whoa. ended up not being able to have food. Um, we averaged less than four hours of sleep a night, had to eat 12,000 calories a day to fuel the effort. Whoa. Um, it, there was so much stuff. The book, the book and the document are amazing. Um, you can go check those out. Uh, but, but just learned, learned a ton from that journey. Um, by day 18, um, I was in Chattanooga, Tennessee. It was 106 degrees outside. I lost concentration for two seconds. The fatigue just hit me at a high level, fell asleep on my bike while I was riding. Whoa. Um, and then in that moment, this is where we talked earlier about a bag of whys, like your reason to keep going. Cause as I was laying there on the road, I'm like my hips banged up. I've got road rash and probably a concussion, actually for sure a concussion. Um, and I looked at my bike and I'm like, there's no way I can get back on my bike and finish today, let alone do 32 more. Yeah. Cause I was, I was, le- you know, you're learning on the journey the whole time as, as yeah, you've going. never done this before. Right. No, yeah. Nobody had done this before and I know yeah. this before. And so every, every day and every moment was new and we were raising money for the childhood obesity epidemic. Mm-hmm. This is a crazy statistic. We're the first generation ever where the parents are slated to outlive the kids. <laughs> Whoa. And so that's, that's problematic. I mean, when I was younger and I, re- I could, I could, right now I could name the two kids in my class or in my entire school that were overweight. 
Yeah. Right. You, that's yeah. how it was. And now you go and it's 50, 60% right. of the whole class. So it's, it truly is an epidemic. And so we partnered with the Jamie Oliver foundation and we were doing a 5k every single night inside of the marathon, inside of the Ironman to raise money for charity. We invited the public to come out. And so we were putting on 50 races across the country. These were races that we were putting on. And so I was, as I'm laying there on the ground, I look at my bike and I'm like, I don't, I don't know how to get back on. And early in the journey, my, my, my little 12 year old daughter, Lucy, she looked at me and she goes, dad, are you okay? And I'm like, no, I'm not. And she goes, I can tell. And she said, I'm going to do all 55 Ks with you. She made that decision in the moment, no training, no preparation. She just recognized at a young age, my dad needs me mm. and I'm going to be there for him. And she made that commitment. I think it was on day three because she had run the first two and she was like, my dad needs me as a 12 year old girl. And as I'm laying there looking at my bike, I thought to myself, if I don't get back on my bike, I'm not going to be able to meet my daughter tonight at seven o'clock for the 5k run. Yeah. And she's not going to be able to accomplish her goal. Right. And so it was a complete paradigm shift for me that I had to show up for her so she could accomplish her goal. It's not just about you anymore. Yeah. And in turn, it helped, it, it changed the entire project. And I found that to be true with anything in life, right? Like we all have our internal goals that it's just, yo, this is for me and something I need to do. But the moment other people now are, mm. you know, either benefiting or affected or whatever else, it just pushes you to go beyond yourself to levels that you could have never done before. Yeah, because if you if you right now, you've got a whole team, if you put all of your goals aside, right? Like you've got them, but let's forget about them for a second. Mm -hmm. And you help every single one of your team members accomplish their goals, what happens? I mean, my goals are gonna get taken care of. Yeah, as a byproduct, mm -hmm. your goals happen. Yeah. And so I've really learned to shift my focus and try to help everybody else accomplish what they're trying to do. And as a byproduct, I win by default. I have to accomplish my goals along the way or your goals shift. Yes. Great point. Or your goals shift. And so in that moment, I got back on my bike. I figured out how to turn the pedals over. I met my daughter. We ran that next marathon and ended up doing all 50. Wow. And changed my life. And that's, that's when I got pushed into the speaking space. Um, you know, yeah, you, you ask people like, what do you want to be when you grow up? Dude, nobody has any idea and it's okay because it's going to change five, six, seven, eight times as you navigate life. Yeah. And you hopefully put yourself in a position where a door opens and you go through it. And when one closes, another one opens. And I, I'm at the point now in my life where I've got 10 doors that are open and I get to choose now which one I go through mm -hmm. and have those experiences. And so my life changed when we did the 50 and we filmed the documentary and my kids' lives changed and got pushed into the speaking world. That wasn't what I thought I'd be doing. Mm -hmm. um, I'm actually an introvert for sure. Mm -hmm. And it's why I'm successful at these long endurance challenges because I am that way. I'm, a, I'm very comfortable with my thoughts. I'm, I'm comfortable being alone. <laughs> I always, I was thinking to myself like, man, I'd be a hell of a, a cross country trucker. <laughs> I, I could get in a truck tomorrow and drive across the country and be totally fine with it. Yeah. And a lot of people can't do that. My wife's one of them. She has to be like walking, moving, doing things. And people think that about me too. But I, I just, I'm totally okay being in my own headspace and just chilling and doing whatever. Yeah. I found that to be true of many successful people and entrepreneurs. You know, I've been around top athletes. They love to be alone and practicing and training and everything else in solitude. Um, I've seen many entrepreneurs who just love to be alone and do their work and just crush things out. Um, I myself am also introverted, even though I have to go do all these public things mm -hmm. like speak on stage and lead people and podcast and all this stuff. But my most enjoyable time is when I'm alone in my thoughts and, you know, spending time with God, planning, thinking of how to solve problems. I get true enjoyment out of that. Oh man, we're, we're a lot alike in that, in that same vein. Um, I, I can just disappear into the mountains on my bike for five, six hours. Mm -hmm. In fact, it's when I'm, it's when I'm in my most deadly. <laughs> yeah. My wife gets very concerned when I disappear for four to five hours on my bike. Cause she knows I'm going to come back with a crazy idea. Yeah. And th th that's actually the space in which I dream. And 
I've come to realize that dreaming is a gift. And as adults, we've forgotten how to dream. Mm. And we've gotten so beat down and put into a box in life and just going through the motions and checking boxes that we no longer dream. And I guarantee you, anybody listening, if you think back to elementary school, most of us were ignoring the math teacher. We're staring out the window. We're dreaming who you want to be. What do you want to become? Aspirations. And then some point in lo- a long life, you got beat down and told how to think. And it's frozen people's minds on how to dream. Well, what happens is I think people still have dreams, but you know, they'll listen to this podcast and be like, bro, you know what? I want to do an Iron Man like James, or you know what? I want to go flip a house like Ryan, whatever the case is. Right. And so they have this dream like, man, my life, that would be so cool. And then the thought ends. Yes. And then it's just back to well, the thought, reality. The thought ends when, if they took action, the moment they face adversity. Right. Then they're like, this is too hard. And to that, I say, go back to the drawing board and dream bigger. Mm-hmm. Because once you dream big enough, that will drive you through any adversity or depression. Because now you're, now you're really working towards something. And for me, my entire life has just been dreaming. And my wife jokes all the time. She's like, cause I'm the dreamer. She's the more of the realist. And that's why we're great together. She jokes all the time. She's like, James is holding on to a handful of balloons and he's floating in the air and I've got to pull him back down to earth. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, but we compliment each other so well. Um, and, and I think that's why we've been happily married for 23 years is because we're so polar opposite of each yeah. other and, and it, and it ultimately makes it work. And so I got pushed into the speaking world. And uh, again, it wasn't what I thought uh, thought I would do. I've been doing it professionally for 10 years now. I'm actually not a great speaker, but I'm phenomenal at telling my story. Yes. And, and, and it's because it's my story. I, I'm passionate about it. And there's so many teaching points that we can do. It's interesting. I, I don't go into an event um, and... I'll offend some speakers, but I don't, I don't go into an event and be like, these are the three pillars of excellence, Yeah, you know? And, and if you do that as a speaker, you're, you're only talking to 10% of the room now Mm -hmm. because the other people aren't resonating with you or on that part of their journey. And I've recognized over doing this for a long enough period of time that everybody's on their own unique journey. Yeah. And some part of my 10 year journey and my family's 10 year journey will resonate with every single person in the, in the, in the audience. And they're going to pull what they need from it. And it's like any good movies. I've had people, I had, I got hired by this one company once to do four events for the company, all different locations, different audiences. It was um, like chapters of their business. Yeah. But the guy that hired me was at all four of them and it was spaced out every three or four months. And every time he would go, I love the changes that you made in your presentation. And I hadn't changed anything. Mm. The difference was, is he had changed and he was at a different part of his journey. Right. And it was the moment that I recognized like everybody's on their own unique journey. Yeah. And if I just share our story with passion, you're going to pull what you need out of it Yeah. for where you're at. And I, I, I do events where a smaller, more intimate, like masterminds or something or uh, high level producers, um, not, not a thousand person audience, but like 30 people. Mm -hmm. And then we'll do a survey on what their takeaway was from the event. And I love it because uh, there's 20 to 30 different takeaways. Mm -hmm. And that's when I know I did my job because I resonated with every person in the audience instead of missing who I was talking to. Yeah. And I think even in the story that you told about how you even got into this and what led to the 50 and 50 days, um, you know, I just, I, I see different elements that people would relate with, right? You know, you lost it all. You're trying to provide, mm. you know, just put food on the table. A lot of people can relate to that story. You know, your daughter stepping up, you know, as a guy with three kids and everything, my kids are now getting older. I'm like, okay, you know, like I got to show out for my kids. And then, you know, just hearing about getting injured and a tough time, people can relate to that. And then the finishing it. And then, you know, this new door opening to Mm. speaking and things that you never would have thought were possible, you know, can relate to that. So it's like, you're absolutely right in that storytelling is such an important skill in order to help 
someone learn the thing they need to learn, you know, because if I just say, hey, you need to do this, people are like, it could be right, but they're not going to receive it or resonate with it. Yeah. Yeah. It's got it's got a it's got a ring true to them. Yeah. Now, let's let's actually talk about the other side of, you know, people when they come to learning. Right. Because now if you're still here, I'm sure you've resonated with something to this point. So I like to think about, hey, you know, let's go get the majority and then let's actually talk some tactical things that um, people can now leave with. Right. So we understand that mental toughness is super important, Um, you know, and, you know, it's funny. It's like, obviously, like you've done what you've done. Um, David Goggins has become very popular for mental toughness now doing, you know, ultra marathons, these different things. Um, even though like when I listen to Goggins, I don't really even know (laughs) what the message is other than just don't be soft. Yeah. But I mean, like, that's the message. It's like, bro, just freaking toughen up, dude, get hard. Like it's not, you you could be way bigger and way stronger and everything than you are. So what would you say is like the core message to what you want people to just really understand about mental toughness? Man, uh, I know there's a lot. Yeah, there is. There is a lot. Um, ultimately, the the greatest gift for anybody is to get out of their own way. And we talked about that a little earlier off camera. But people are ultimately losing the conversation with themselves. And to gain knowledge and become more mentally tough, it's through those experiences. And you just got to get out and do stuff. You just got to get out and do stuff. And we, we live in a in a day and age where people are waiting at home sitting on their phones, scrolling, watching, consuming, and waiting for their passion to knock on their door and say, I'm here, take part. (laughs) And you're not going to find your passion by sitting at home. It's by engaging. I I didn't know I loved sports until I started to do them. I didn't know I resonated with wrestling and combat sports until I did it. I didn't know I loved golf until I did it. I didn't know I loved triathlon until I did it. And so I I try now to find reasons to say yes to things that make me feel uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And in fact, earlier last year, I got a phone call and they were like, hey, uh, we're putting on this charity boxing event and um, will you will you fight? And I'm like, no, (laughs) I don't want to fight. Yeah. And I hung up the phone and then I was like, oh. I have to fight. Yeah, I got to I got to see what this is all about. I have to fight because as soon as something scares me and I want to say no to it, then I have to find a reason to say yes to it. Because there was a reason it froze me in my tracks and that I didn't want to do it. And that's because mm-hmm. it made me uncomfortable. Yeah. And when that happens, I know there's something I need to learn from it. And so you got to at least try it. You know, you may yeah. never do it again. You may And I won't. <laughs> and I won't. And it was an but it but it was an absolutely amazing experience that changed my life. Yeah. And so I accepted the challenge. I was I was the main event. Um they paired me up with a guy that had been training for a year. They, they gave me they gave me 8 weeks to to they they gave me a coach and said you have 8 weeks and you're the main event. There's going to be 2000 people in the audience. Yeah. Um go. And I was like, "Okay, I can do this." I'm yeah. mentally tough. And so I, I went into the fight gym Yeah, and they wrap your hands and they put the gloves on you. And it's one thing to like punch a bag and learn a one, a two, a, th- a six, seven, eight, and oh, right, all these different punch combinations and how to move and, and duck and weave all these things. And I was like, okay, I've got this. And they're like, okay, it's time to get in the ring. And I'm like, okay, bring it. And all of a sudden this girl walks up from around the corner and they're like, that's who you're fighting. <laughs> and I'm like, no, man, that's not who I'm fighting. And they're like, that's who you're fighting. Her name's Anna. Her name's Anna. Her name's I'm Anna. You. <laughs> and so I got in the ring and I, I couldn't punch Anna. Um, there was just something about it. I, I didn't want to hit, not a girl, but I didn't want to hit a person. Hmm. And, and I had to, I had to try to figure out mentally how to overcome that. Right. And I I remember just, she, she punched me in the face 500 times (laughs) in, in, in one one minute. (laughs) And it was, it was the most humiliating, the more like I am the, 
I'm the iron cowboy. I'm the toughest person in the room. I'm the mental <laughs> giant. I'm the guy. And I just got the living shit beat out of me <laughs> by Anna, <laughs> by Anna. And so I went home and I just like, <laughs> I just cried. How do you tell your wife that? I, she, well, she, I was, I was in the shower crying and she's like, what is happening? A girl beat me up. And basically that's what I said. And, and I had to call one of my friends and, and, and he helped me walk through it. And he was like, look, it's just a game. And life, it truly is just a game. Yeah. And it's how you figure out how to gamify it and make it work for you. And so then I was like, okay, this is, I'm not hitting a person. I'm just trying to score points. Yeah. And it took me a while, but then I got back in the ring and started to learn. Um, and fight day came. And I, get, I gave it everything I had. And I was the main event and it was so cool. I got to walk out to uh valhalla I, I i believe my spirit is i'm a viking yeah and so I, I my son got to walk out with me and uh the whole thing my family all my kids are ringside front row two thousand people in the audience and when you step in that ring nobody's coming to save you no it's just you and that other person that's trying to take your head off mm -hmm. and the bell the bell rings and we square up in the middle of the ring and he proceeds to punch me in the face as hard as he can for about 10 seconds. And I get backed up into the ropes and he is pummeling me. And the ref steps in between us and I'm like, oh no, the fight's over. <laughs> and he gives me a standing eight count. And we're, I'm like 10 seconds into the fight. Yeah. And I, I had a decision in that moment. It was like all the other decisions I've made when I got pulled down into the water, when I crashed on my bike, when they knocked on my door and took away my home, like all of these moments in my life where we get to decide, okay, what are we going to do now? Because we recognize that nobody's coming. Mm -hmm. And I got off the ropes and I flipped a switch and it wasn't the first time I flipped the switch and I was able to do it because I'd had experiences in my past where I've done it before. And my, my, my dad was watching live streaming from Canada. And my wife was watching front row. And afterwards, they both said the same thing to me, independent of each other, not knowing it. They said, when you stepped off the ropes, we saw your face and we knew you were a different person. And 27 seconds later, I knocked him out. Whoa. And the fight's over. It was the only knockout of the night. I knocked him out of the ring. And it was the most electrifying feeling. And I've crossed hundreds of finish lines. I've had amazing moments in my life. I'm not talking marriage and kids. I'm talking like athletic pursuits and accomplishments. It was the most electrifying moment when you connect and, and they drop, <laughs> they drop. That feeling is so incredible. And the 2000 people erupt. You've spoken in front of 2000 people yeah. and you know, when that goes, when that bang happens or you say something and they erupt or whatever it is, that's electric. Yeah. And man, I was so overwhelmed. Now I don't want to ever fight again, but I'm so grateful to have had that experience because I'm now I'm stacking it up with all the other experiences that I've had. And I'm going to draw upon those moments whenever I get in front of a difficult challenge mm -hmm. coming up in the future. So now I, I'm no longer scared of any difficult situation or challenge or like, it's just life, man. And we, we get to choose how we navigate it. And I've put myself in a position now that I'm ready. Like come at me, bro. Yeah. You know what I mean? And, and I say that not in terms of like, we're going to fight, but just like life, come at me, give, give me whatever you have. I'm not scared anymore. And, and I'll, I'll take it on. Yeah. No, I love it, dude. I, uh, first off, I thought that story was you were going to, cause you're like, dude, I'll never do it again. I was like, yep. He definitely got knocked out. <laughs> so <laughs> that, I did I, not, <laughs> I gotta, I gotta watch that clip for sure. I'll show um, it to you. Yeah. Yeah. I want to see the clip, but, um, no, it just, you know, it, it all goes back to perspective, right? Like you tap back into all the other hard stuff you've done over the years and you're like, all right, this ain't much different than everything else. It's time to get back on the horse and do this. And, um, you know, people have asked me in my life, you know, just for example, speaking on stage since you're, you're talking about like, dude, do you get nervous? I'm like, dude, you got to remember, I played eight seasons playing in front of thousands of fans mm -hmm. every night. Like. I've represented my country, yeah. you know, on the international stage. Um, 
in this case, it was the Philippines and, uh, you know, playing country to country, you know, and just How, like, what's that feel like? It was crazy, man. And, you know, and you're in a hostile environment because, you know, this was back in 2012 and we were in um, Taiwan playing against Chinese Taipei. And, uh, you know, they got this packed stadium with like 10,000 people so cool. and they're rooting against you for yeah, their yeah, team. Yeah. And uh, they got all this stuff going on. Everything's against you. And then, you know, you got to show up. And um, yeah, you know, I remember I don't think we had gotten a hit against them in like the first four or five innings. And I came up and roped a double. And, um, you know, it's just a, you know, it's a good feeling. I've had walk off home runs and I've done, you know, game winning plays and everything and nothing beats it. Like, you know, winning the game for your team. And I think it's just perspective, dude. Cause I've also been on the other side, you know, striking out to end the game, losing, yeah, yeah. you know, you, and I've been on that side way more than the other side. And you just think about it and you're like, dude, I mean, like, whatever, I get embarrassed, I get embarrassed. It's not a big deal. I've been embarrassed many times in my life in front of thousands and thousands of people. Yeah. What do I care? And it's perspective. It all goes back to perspective. And I think what's interesting about what you brought up, and as an athlete, I was thinking about it from my perspective. And I was like, yeah, that makes sense because, you know, when you're doing a Ironman, sure, you are competing against the field, but, you know, unless you're really like, one of the guys that's going to win, mm -hmm. you're not really competing. It's it's you. You're just competing against you versus a boxing match, a baseball game, a basketball. Like we are competing head to head. There's yep. one winner. Let's rock. And uh, so it's different when you do actually like defeat an opponent. That's not you. Yeah, for sure. And, and you just talked about like those moments where you did strike out yeah. and there was the, the losing moments and then there was the winning moments. And that, that is just like life with peaks and valleys. And we learn in both those places and people are trying to figure out how to go through life without having those valleys. Yeah. And, and I think that's the wrong way to navigate life because it's in the valleys that we learn the most about who we are. And in those humbling discouraging moments is when is an opportunity to reflect and become better and say, why did that happen? And how do I help to not have that happen again? Mm. And so I, 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 I talked about this a couple of days ago, but Tom Hanks said this too shall pass. And he wasn't just talking about bad moments. He was talking about good and bad. Yeah. And the ebbs and flows of life. And then Matthew McConaughey said, this too shall pass and you get to choose how fast you learn the lessons. Because in life, we all have to learn the same lessons. And it's how fast we run through the fire and adapt and evolve. Mm. And take that wheel of life and control it. And so the peaks and the valleys are inevitable. Yeah. Those failures are going to happen. And I don't, I've, I've been asked the question too, like, hey, when was the moment that you failed? And... I truly can't come up with one. And that's not from arrogance. That's because I look at those moments and they were learning opportunities, not failures. hundred percent. And so for me, I just, they're just such growth moments. And I always try to figure out how to do something better. Now, when we did the 50, we didn't do it perfectly because nobody else had done it. There was no roadmap. There was no standard. And so we, we made mistakes. We stumbled, but chose to continue on. Yeah. And that's what sparked the, the hundred, which we call the conquer 100. And there's going to be a brand new documentary coming out about it. Um, it premieres March 27th at the Sundance film festival. Um, and then our new book is called iron hope, and that's going to be coming out soon too. But the pandemic hit and I saw an opportunity and everybody was panicking and freaking out. And you could tell in that moment when the pandemic was happening, who in their lives had done something hard and, and could navigate it and who hadn't and was being driven by fear yeah. and the unknown. Mm -hmm. And there was like two camps yes. and you could really tell that person has mental fortitude. That person does not. Yes. And I'd always wanted to redo the 50 and, and, and learn from the mistakes Do it better and learn from the mistakes that we had made. But I was like, man, that was too, it was too crazy, too chaotic. And what can I learn from that to do it better? Because I really always wanted to find out how many consecutive Ironmans I could do. Yeah. And I didn't get to find out in the 50 because it was so filled with chaos, confusion, logistics, travel, fatigue, all of it. And so I said to myself, okay, the pandemic happened. No more speaking, no more coaching, no more racing, nothing. What do I do? So I saw it as an opportunity. So I said, if I can remove chaos 
if I can put systems and team in place, could I double what everybody said was impossible and could I do a hundred? And I talked to my wife and there was two guys that have been with me my entire career. They're called the wingmen. Mm -hmm. And I said, do them. they run and stuff with you? What do they do? So they're, they're athletes during the 50, they were in charge of like driving the motor home through the night, Got dealing it. with all the sleep. chaos. Yep. Now the hundred was going to be done in, in a remote location. My home was going to be home base and I was going to do the same course every single day. So now their that job gets even more monotonous, but there's a gift behind it. Okay. And I'll get to that in a second. Remind me. Yeah. So the wingman, one of them's a natural runner. He's a 242 marathoner, which is a 505 pace. Yeah. And then the other guy's an incredible cyclist. And so I said, okay, your guys' roles are going to be different this time. Once I got everybody on board and bought off on the project, they got excited. Casey was going to run. He's the runner. He was going to run all the marathons with me, mm. be there right beside me. And, K and Aaron was going to ride every bike ride with me. Got it. And so they became my protector. And so we put this whole project together and then we started on, the, on this journey of doing a hundred in a row. And that's, that's an hour long podcast in itself. Yeah. We, we won't dive too big deep into that, but I, I was just trying to do the mistakes that I'd made and do it better and truly find out what the human potential is. Right. Um, and navigate a journey. And, you know, I told you before day 59, well, we'll, we'll say this day. Number one, it was March 1st. It was 18 degrees outside is when we started this was 2020 during COVID 2021. Okay. After. Okay. Uh, still during COVID. Yeah. yeah. We're just coming out of it. Yeah. Um, but I recognize like people are at home craving something to consume. Mm -hmm. And so I'm like, this is an opportunity. We did it to raise money for um, sex trafficking to free human beings. And anyways, we, we, we hit every weather system in the first month um rain sleet snow hail and it was just i've never been so cold in my life but we made it through the first 50 days to perfection so i i got to reset my history mm -hmm. and and uh we silenced every critic and it was fun to watch people go from ah, i don't know if you can do this to cheering for us to becoming fans to then coming out and participating with us we had thousands of people come from around the world and join us and on day 59 i was in a really significant bike crash um knocked unconscious and had to had to really figure out again that bag of why is like why am i doing this mm -hmm. ended up finding out later that i had cracked my l5 vertebrae in that crash ended up doing 41 of those ironmans with basically a broken back wow and then um when we finished um so many things happened but you can catch it in the documentary in the book but when we finished day 100 my family was waiting for me at the finish line huge party everybody thought we were going to go home and sleep for two weeks and recover and unpack what happened and we made a last minute decision that we were like i just had the deepest impression i have to do one more mm. and everybody we swam in, a, in an outdoor pool every single morning and th athletes came and filled the pool and swam with us and supported us in the whole works well on day 101 um, nobody knew we were doing this and I got up and I went to the pool and I got in the water by myself uh -huh. and I ended up swimming the 2.4 miles and my daughter Lucy went live on Instagram like she did every morning. And I just felt so compelled that I had to do that because I felt I'd be a hypocrite if I went around the world, got on stages and said, I get it. Life's hard. You can do one more if I didn't do it myself. Right. And I believe that leaders, they lead from the front and I don't want you to do what I tell you to do. I want you to do what I did myself. Right. I want to set the example. Right. And so I got in the water, swam 2.4 miles by myself because in life, there's going to be moments where you have to do it by yourself. Mm -hmm. And I was ready to bike 112 solo. And my team was like, they saw me in the water by myself and they were like, uh, -uh not today. And they got on their bikes and they showed up and we rode 112 miles together. And it was a true victory lap. And we laughed, we told stories, we reminisced. Um, and it was everything I wanted it to be. And then that night we ran the final marathon. So we ended up doing 101 consecutive days, 14,000 plus miles. Wow. No days off, no excuses, pure chaos, um, just in pursuit of human potential with the purpose to free humans that don't have a chance to find out what their potential is. Yeah. And we ended up raising over a million dollars for the charity and that's gone on to free countless human beings. Yeah. And that, that, that to me was the biggest why the driver, 
um, so many other side reasons and purposes and changed my life. And um, that's why we're sitting here today. Um, overcoming mental toughness is, and winning the conversations that we're having with ourselves is the purpose of life. Yeah. To find self-love and um, that relationship with God mm-hmm. and community. Just, just this relentless pursuit of joy. What do you say to somebody who, like you said, they can't even spend an hour by themselves because they get so consumed by their past failures and inadequacies. You know, I get people who are like, man, I missed my opportunity. I missed my shot mm-hmm. in this thing. I, I had, you know, I lost it all doing this thing. And it's just, they're so caught up in the past that they can't even see how great the future can be. What do yeah. you say to them? Yeah. I had a buddy that lost everything, um, lost his wife and deep into drugs and alcohol and, um, lost everything. Um, super successful, multimillionaire, lost everything. And he decided one day to go back to medical school. He's 50. And so when you said, I've, I've missed my window or my opportunity, that's a lie. Mm-hmm. Everybody is telling themselves lies and it, it makes them, it validates their, their thought process of I'm not good enough. And again, it goes all the way back to the beginning. We have to forgive ourselves for our past and the mistakes that we've made because that frees up the path to a better future. And, and for the people that are struggling and losing the conversations with themselves and I'm not good enough and I've missed my window, um, you just need to hit a reset button and, and you have to sit in silence for one minute mm-hmm. and you just have to slowly gain momentum. Success breeds success and confidence breeds confidence. And you're sitting in a space where you don't have any confidence and you don't have any wins. And so you just have to get your first win. And it can be something so small, like literally sit in silence for one minute. That's a win. Yeah. And that's where you have to start because nobody starts out as the expert and everybody's online. I'm the expert. I'm the coach. I'm the mentor. Look at me. I'm flashy. I'm this. And it's freezing society in fear. Mm because we're comparing ourselves to what everybody else is doing and we are in comparison mode that we're not good enough. Yeah. And you have to be okay with sucking in the beginning. And I tell people that all the time. I'm like, look, you're going to suck. Just hundred percent. It's okay. Like nobody's ever great when they first start. But on the other hand, I I also resonate with what you said of like success breeds more success, Mm -hmm. right? For me, I just look back at all my past success in lots of different industries and fields and things I've really wanted to accomplish. And I've been able to do it. Like in my mind, I believe, yeah, if I truly wanted to do an Ironman, I could do it. You know? So it's just like at the end of the day, um, I only believe that though, because of all the other things I've believed and done. Right. And so I get it from somebody who has not had a lot of success yet. They don't have the past experience to draw from, but You know, my rebuttal is, well, you got to start somewhere. And to your point, it's got to be small. Dude, you started selling couches, (laughs) flipping couches for crying out loud. Like that's, yeah, that's such a, I love hearing random things that people do to get started. And that's the problem is people just aren't created enough. They, they don't believe that there's an opportunity or a way for them. And I wish people would fully understand the level of abundance that exists in this world. Mm. There's enough, more than enough for everybody to have everything that they want and beyond. Yeah. You just have to go get it. I am such a believer and I'm in the camp of you can create and be and do whatever you want. Mm -hmm. It's a, it's so possible. And I just, I just wish I could give that gift to people that are struggling right now is just the perception and the belief that you can go do and be whatever you want. And it is so truth, but people just can't see it because they're, they're just stuck in a loop of beating themselves up and living in their past. And the greatest gift that someone can be is to be right here, right now in any moment that they're in. How do you get somebody motivated though? Because there are people and like, I even see them within my own company. Like they're just very content to be average and like where they're at. And like, they have no desire to really, you know, go beyond that. And I think that's most people. It is most people. And and for me, I've just learned that those people aren't my people. Right. And I can't change anybody 
and you have to make the change for yourself. Mm -hmm. And you have a finite amount of energy. I have a finite amount of energy. And I'm going to give my energy to the people that put their hand up and say, I'm with you. I'm, I'm with you. Let's go do this together. And I'm like, great, I will help you. But you have to bridge the gap and do the work. And as soon as that person does, I'm going to give you all of my energy, time and attention. And I do not have any energy, time and attention for someone that's not putting up their hand yeah. that doesn't want to engage. that doesn't want to show up. And I'm sorry. That's not, it's not my problem. And you get, you get to decide how you're going to show up in your life and like it or not look in the mirror. And if you're winning, it's your fault. If you're losing, it's also your fault. If you're fat, it's your fault. If you're skinny, it's your fault. If you're ripped, it's your fault. If you're, you're wealthy, it's your fault. If you're broke, it's your fault. Yeah. Right. And so I no longer, uh, I mean, I have empathy and compassion, but I've learned that I can't change anybody. Yeah. And I just have to lead from the front and those individuals that put up your hand. People ask me all the time, how do you put, how do you put an unbelievable team around you? How do you, how do you find your people? And I say, you show up in your life, you lead and your people will present themselves to you. And that's who you give your time and energy to. They're going to resonate with the mission. They will resonate with the mission. And then you start, you've created now your tribe and you guys go on and forge greatness together. Yeah. And I'm, I can't help someone that doesn't step up to the plate and take a swing. I can't help you, but I will help you. If you get up to the plate and have the courage, start winning, start creating success, start creating that momentum, showing up in your life, creating those daily wins. Is there, is there a way for somebody to get over indecision? Cause that is, the big thing I see today. Hardest thing to hardest thing to do in life is to 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 make a decision and to start. Yeah, we're we're, we're paralyzed with too much information. Unfortunately, yeah, they're like, well, maybe I should do real estate. Well, now maybe I should run an Ironman. Maybe that's what I should do. Yeah, the the the, the what people need to do is choose one thing and just go after it. And if if you change your mind, it's okay. But you had to have at least tried the thing. Least, right. And people are like, okay, if I, if I start something, I, I have to be a hundred percent certain I got to research it. I got to like, right. And that's why people you know. don't start is because there will never be certainty in anything. And again, you don't know you like something until you do it. And then you don't know you hate it until you do it too. I didn't know I'd hate getting punched in the face. until <laughs> like I'm punched in the <laughs> but, face, but you probably had an idea. You I did have like an it. idea, but now I, but now I know because I did it. And so indecision is, is one of the most crippling things that exists in today. Yeah. Uh, doing nothing is also crippling and destructive. Well, doing nothing is a decision. A hundred percent. Yeah. It's paralyzing, but you're doing nothing because of your belief system. And so I believe that we can, in fact, I know because I, because of my crashes and trauma and everything that I intentionally put myself through, my brain got stuck in hyperdrive fight or flight. I couldn't get back to parasympathetic. And so for two years post 100, I was in this like deep depression, brain fog, confusion, and it's because my brain was broken. Mm. And I had to figure out a way I had to take the initiative and uh, my wife pushed me. She was like, something's wrong. <laughs> You're not okay. And you need help. And I think that's the first step in getting out of your own way is being okay, asking for help. So what'd you do? I had to go to brain therapy, a cognitive cool. brain therapy. And so what they did is a, the place that I went to, it's a, one of the number one facilities for concussions, brain trauma, injuries, PTSD. And what they do is they slide you into an MRI machine and th there's a little window that you can see through and I'm holding like an old school Nintendo pad. And they would ask you questions that you would read and then you would either answer them in your head or you would push the buttons on the joystick. So nothing was audible. And as you're answering the questions, they're designed to fire different neurological pathways in your brain. And the imagery is taking pictures and then they can see gray matter where the pathways are blocked. And then they put you through an entire repatterning sequence and therapy to reset your brain. Our brains are malleable. And, and the point of this story is if you're stuck right now, seek help. Again, we're in an information age that it's out there. We have access to whatever we want. Most of it's free until you figure out a way to get higher levels that you have to pay for, but you can fully reset, retrain, reshape, reprogram your brain to change the lens that you see life. Mm -hmm. And that's truly the gift, but people are stuck believing that the way they are now is who they are, but it's only because of your environment growing up and, and, and what you were taught. You can change that at any given moment. 
If you don't like the path that you're on and the trajectory that you're going, change it. Right. But, it, and it's, it's not going to happen overnight. It's slow, small, incremental baby steps. And again, that growth starts to happen. And once you hit momentum, man, growth is exciting and, 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 and hyper. Yeah. But it's amazing. Well, I think it's important to hear that, you know, and I don't know if this is the case, but definitely one of your darkest times came after your biggest success. Yes. Right. Isn't that an interesting thing where, you know, people will spend however long trying to achieve this, this goal in their life. That's the big thing. And then they reach the goal and Sounds then they realize great. like, wow, okay, well, that wasn't as fulfilling as maybe I thought. And yeah. now what? Now yeah. you're wandering. Yeah. I've, I've, I've learned in life that goals, objectives, destinations is a constant moving mark because we're constantly changing and evolving. And there is a lot of people that are stagnant and sitting in the same place and what complacency and whatnot. And I, I, I have compassion for them because they're not, they're not living. And I look back at all these different parts of my journeys and the different mountaintops that I've hit and the big goals and the world records. Um, and it's the process that I miss. It's the, it's the struggle. It's the adversity. It's the problem solving. It's the, in the trenches, it's the figuring it out with your, with your, you know, friends and, and allies. It's, it, it, it's cliche, but it is about the journey. I, I actually enjoy the uncertainty. I love the uncertainty. Yeah, I'm like, Hey, I think I have a plan and I think this is going to be really good, but man, we're going to find out. <laughs> My wife had to have a major paradigm shift because she wanted like a controlled environment all the time. And yeah. she wanted, I, I want this house and I want to live here and I want to be here forever. And we, built a dream home and recently she was like i want to move <laughs> i i now don't like being in one place for too long because i'm i feel stagnant mm. and i think there's beauty in the unknown and constant moving and she's like and i'm like hey what are we doing next year she's like i don't know and it's okay yeah and i think that's that's a gift and again looking back i think it's only a gift though after you've achieved a lot that you true. realize that you know what? I've achieved a lot of things and like, I don't know what's going to happen next and it's all good. And it's okay. Yeah. I, I, I think one of the gifts in life is, is getting to the point where you can let go of the reins and, and understand or recognize that life is that journey that has ebbs and flows mm -hmm. and it's not, it's not a straight line. It's a riverbed that's moving and we need to be fluid. Yeah. And move through it. And this opportunity comes up, but that's, the, that's the point is people are waiting for their opportunity to happen. And, and we need to be at all times, be game ready Yeah, and just be game ready for when that door opens. Cause yeah. this, you said it before people are, uh, feel that they've missed the opportunity. They didn't miss the opportunity. They weren't ready for the opportunity mm -hmm. and the opportunity passed it by and somebody else took it. Yes. And, and I, and I, I, I now recognize that if I'm ready at all times, when the opportunity happens, I can take action and I can move on that. Also, if you're not so single minded on, oh, you know, I'm ignoring all everything because uh, this is the only thing I'm, I'm doing and whatever, because like a lot of people, they hear that advice of, well, they said I got to focus on one thing and just do it. And then they're not open to mm -hmm. other opportunities and things that are around them. You know, like I'm constantly looking and it's that same mindset of, yeah, next year. I don't know. Yeah. Right. Because I have buddies who are like, no, this is our five year target. This is what we're doing year one, year two, year. Th I'm like, how can you know? <laughs> like, you don't know who's going to walk through your door tomorrow. Yeah. The, the only long term goals I have is I'm planning for retirement so that I can golf more. There we enjoy go. My family and do these things. Right. And what's so, your handicap? I used to be a four. OK, I'm about right now. My index, I think it's a eight point five. OK, yeah, we'll have to play. I'm um, a four. Oh, you are a four. Oh, yeah. you're a stick. Yeah, that's good, man. I, I mean, if I'm going to go do it. I got to, I got to do it. I missed my player back in the day, uh, before I switched, before I lost everything, I was big into golf. I actually moved to the States, got a job at a golf course, golfed every single day, uh, took my player ability test twice uh -huh. and missed it by one stroke both times. Mm. And it, it just wasn't paying the bills. And that's when I was like, okay, I have a family. I have to be responsible. Yeah. yeah. Um, and part of me like regrets 
not chasing that dream, I, I believe I could have been a professional golfer. Yeah. If I put as much time as I did into riding my bike, swimming and running, I a hundred percent could have been a pro golfer. Oh, 1000%. Uh, because golf is, as you know, it's all mental. Yes. You have to, it's literally the hardest game on the planet and watching those guys on TV, it is so remarkable. Do you believe even at do. almost 50 years old now with your mental fortitude, if you gave up all the other stuff and focused solely on golf, do you think you could be a pro? I had this conversation just the other day. My daughter said, dad, you should go to the senior tour. <laughs> and, I, and I said, I said, I'm not even close. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And she said, but you could. And I said, yes. And I had to, I had to have that conversation with myself. Like, is that something I would really want to right. do? You, you'd have to truly want to do. Yeah. It. I think at my point, at this point in my life, like I, I think I could do it. Yeah. But I don't want to, um, yeah. I enjoy the game too much that I just want to play it for fun. I don't want that pressure. Um, I, I'm just in a different place in my life. It was a dream of mine. Um, but I'm okay with that not being the dream now. Yeah. I just love the game. Yeah. I, I love the, I love the game. I love getting outside. I love how damn hard it is. Holy cow. It is such, it's, yeah. It, you hit that. I mean, you know, you're a, four, if you're a four, if you, you can go shoot 72 and then 85 and you're like, how? Yeah. What, what happened in from today to, to tomorrow that it just didn't happen. And it's, yeah. that, that's, what's so magical about golf is it's, it's the, it's the pursuit of perfection that we'll never attain. It's the, it's the perfect parallel for life. Yeah. It well, really that's why is. I was it's curious beautiful. if you believed, because for me, I believe I could do it. I've only been playing two and a half years and hold on. Yeah. You're a four and mm -hmm. you've only been playing two and a half years. Yeah. Because I, I didn't play while I was playing baseball. Yeah. So Dude, I only, it's, it's hard to transition from a baseball swing to a golf swing though. Oh, I know. That's why I never played. I didn't want to mess up my baseball swing. And so after I finally started playing in 2021 because golf got popular. Yes, it did. And I was like, I bought a piece of land on a golf course for my dream home. And mm. I was like, well, you know, I might as well pick up the sticks and start playing. So that was how the journey started. Then I became addicted. But to get where I'm at today, I put in work, but not nearly any close to the amount of work I could do. Like, I believe I could, I don't want to say easily be a pro, but I know what being a pro is. Yeah, for sure. So like, and I'm still 34, like I'm not, super dude you old. should do it i know it's just but once again it goes back to purpose yeah you know is it worth all yeah. the other stuff giving it because i do know the cost yes the cost is eight hours a day doing this yep. nothing else and you know i'm not willing to pay that yeah. and like you i just enjoy the game i d you know i don't want to make it a job it's fun yeah. well we're gonna have to play yeah no we're definitely gonna play but the reason i asked was because anyone listening to this would be like dude that's crazy to think that at 49 at you know 34 and it's like well no it's not when you've run that many marathons and ironmans and everything and you've accomplished things nobody in the world's accomplished you literally believe you could do whatever you want as long as you truly want to do it yeah and the same is true for me it's like dude if i wanted to play pro baseball i did it i wanted to get good at social media i did it i wanted to start businesses and be a world-class real estate investor i did it Want to throw world-class events? I did it. Anything I've ever wanted to do, I did. Mm -hmm. Now, did I reach the ultimate goal of where I wanted to be? No. Did I reach a world-class level? Yes. It's something It's something to be said about being 1% in anything. That's what I'm saying. And you've done it in five, six different categories. Right. And that's what's forming the belief that anything is, exactly. is truly possible. And, and again, that's the gift in life is to get to the point where you no longer have a ceiling on what you believe is possible. And you just have to decide what's worth it. What's the sacrifice? What's the benefit? It goes back to dreaming. Yes. You know, I got this dream now that sparked in me um, from visiting a golf course that, um, ah, dang, what's the, Larry Ellison. And he, he had his own private golf course in Palm Springs. It was literally his course. His house is on it. Mm. <laughs> and I was like, dude, this dude owns his whole course by himself. That's crazy. He visits it like once a, a year you know, and then they turned it into a hotel and all this fun stuff. But I was like, dude, how cool would it be to own your own course? And then I was like, that's kind of selfish, but how cool would it be, you know, to start your own community and have like-minded people and your tribe and your community. And then I started to think, well, how could I tie in faith and everything else to this? And I was like, well, what if, you know, we, we sectioned off a piece of it and we made like this Christian retreat center. And then we had like this shopping center that supported 
the retreat center. And like, I just started to formulate all these ideas in my mind. Yeah. This is dreaming. This is dreaming. Yes. It was literally a dream. And I was like, it was while I was inspired at this course. I was like, I like what he did, but it was too selfish. Hmm. I don't want my own course. That's just me. I want to, I do want my own course. But where's the give back? Yeah. But with everyone benefiting from it. Yeah. And that, that's just what they did in, in uh, St. George right now with this black desert course is man, they chiseled it out of the block black lava and there's tons of courses in St. George, but they were like, we're going to create a premier experience and they just finished building this course. It just opened up. There's going to be a PGA event next year in October. That's sick. On this course. Just starting out. And someone just had a vision and how many courses have been around forever and don't, can't get a PGA event. Mm -hmm. And this, somebody had the vision and the dream to be like, nope, this is happening. I'm going to build this and and it's, go it's going to be this. How do people start dreaming better and believing they can do, does it start with a small dream? It, ha it has to, everything has to start small because what happens is this is actually super important. I'm glad you brought it up. It, people go too big, too quick. I hear people do that. that like they don't even own a property. They're like I'm going to be a billionaire. I'm yeah. like, chill out, dude. Like, let's, <laughs> let's, let's back it up again. Now to be a billionaire is a great goal. Mm -hmm. If that's what you want. Yeah. But you have to shelf that because now there's the journey and the process to get there. Yeah. And what people do is they set the big goal and then they don't respect the time frame that it takes to get there. Mm -hmm. And ultimately they fail because they were in a hurry to get there. And here's where the problem is. Now they start associating themselves in their mind as a failure. Yeah. And then anything they try, they try to go big because you hear everyone says dream big, do big things and all that. Big dreams are great. Big goals are great. But you need to have a realistic time frame in order to accomplish those. And in order to do anything big, you have to have the knowledge and experience along the way. Those are the stepping stones. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, dream big, know what it is, and then shelf it. Yeah. And then reverse engineer it back to step one and then create that momentum that we talked about and start yeah. start formulating those successes. Yeah. You put that in a great way because I've never tr I've never been able to articulate how I've thought and dreamed. And just to give a great example with this, this golf course I'm talking about, mm. I haven't put some time frame on it. Like, dude, I need to do this by like next year. Mm. It's just like, yeah, this is a dream I have. I have no time frame on it. Whenever God wills it, it'll happen. Until then, I am going to be open to the possibility and I'm going to be, you know, letting people know about it, which I'm doing right now. And if a piece of land that is just so amazing and premier pops up, I already know what I'm going to do with it. And, you know, I've been developing the skill sets to be able to make the dream a reality over the last decade. You know, I understand real estate. I now understand golf. I understand raising money to go do such a thing. You know, it's like it took 10 years of building relationship skills and everything else to even make this an actual possibility. And even still, I may not it may not happen for another decade. I don't know. I don't have this crazy time frame on it. Well, it's, it's like we talked about being game ready. And if you believe in God, you believe in energy and the energy that we send out is what comes back to us. Mm -hmm. And you're dreaming and sending out the energy and someone is going to pick up on that energy and create the opportunity for it to happen. And oh, I've already been getting deals sent to me. Exactly. People saying, oh, bro, I will. I've been, you know, managing golf courses for 20 years. I will quit the moment, you know, you got the deal. I'll, I'll do it all. I know yeah. this designer. I know this. We yeah, can set yeah, up yeah. this. And, that, and that's why you got to dream and then you got to talk about it and you got to send out that energy because that's the only way that people will be attracted to you and want to partner with you because you can't do it on your own. No, no way. There's no way you could do that on your own. And so, but that's the problem is people don't dream and then they're not sending out that energy and then doors never open. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's, I'm actually going to, I want a front row seat to watch you do this, man. It's going to be exciting to, to watch and make happen. And I'm, I'll, I'm going to play your course one day. Yeah. We'll play it together. Hell yeah. Well, dude, I appreciate you coming out and inspiring people, man. Um, I've had a ton of fun talking because like I said, it's not often I get to talk to number one athletes because, you know, most of the people in this space are not athletes. Sure. Um, so I always love talking to athletes. But number two, just talking to somebody who gets it from a mental standpoint. And for me, I haven't done anything close to in my mind as hard of things as you have done. Like I, I think about what you've done. I'm like, holy crap, that's hard. Like, man. That's a lot of work. So I appreciate you sharing that because it's making me be like, all right, you know what? How do I 
extend myself to do something very uncomfortable that I don't want to do? What's the point in my life that I'm super complacent at, right? Because maybe I'm pushing forward in business, but maybe I'm not testing myself physically to seeing what I can do. Yeah. And and here's, here's maybe a good final thought too, is um, we need to not compare ourselves to what everybody else is doing and accomplishing because we're all on those different parts of our journey. Okay. And everybody's heart is different. Yes. Right. So my mom struggles with obesity and has her entire life. But those 5Ks that we were doing every single night during the 50, my mom said, I just want to do one 5K with my son. Mm. And she came out and she did the first 5K and she struggled through it. Yeah. And I remember seeing her because she was the last person to cross the finish line. Mm -hmm. And I, I went up to her and I said, mom, how was that? And she said, that was the hardest thing I've ever done. Yeah. And I'll never forget what she said next. She said, can I do it again tomorrow? Wow. And I said, yes, I will see you tomorrow. And for five straight days, she showed up and she did the hardest thing she could. Yeah. And on that last day, she was still last, but her head was up and she was proud. Yes. Because she was facing her demons on purpose every single day, challenging herself and forcing growth. And so my mom's heart was five, five Ks. Yes. My daughter's, my daughter Lucy's heart was 55 Ks. My heart was 50 Ironmans. Mm -hmm. Everybody's heart is different and it's okay. Yes. As long as you show up and keep challenging and expanding what your heart can be. Mm. And so just because my heart is 50 Ironmans and that doesn't mean you're not showing up Doing in your one. capacity. Yeah. And whatnot. And someone listening to this, like when I first started, guess what? My heart was four mile fun run. That was yeah. hard. Mm -hmm. And so if your heart right now is literally getting up off the couch, just do it. Mm. Just get up off the couch, go outside, take a deep breath of fresh air and recognize that you're alive and that you get to do it one more time today. Yeah. And you get to show up and then eventually your barometer and that ultimate version of who you are and who you're trying to chase down is a moving target. And the goal in life is to continually chase that person. Yeah. And your heart becomes easier and easier and easier until you get to the point where you absolutely feel limitless in life and anything is possible. I love it. That leads me to one final question before we wrap up. Who's the hardest man in the world? Is it you or Goggins? It's you. It's me. It's you. There you go. You heard I, it. I'll just put a little context behind that. <laughs> um, I, I, I get, I get compared to Goggins all the time. I believe it. Um, He's, he's in a much bigger space than I am. Millions of people know who he is. He's become pulp culture. Yeah. I don't resonate with him, um, on, on many levels. Um, I, I believe family first. Yeah. Um, he doesn't have any children and I was saying people that don't have kids are bad. They just don't have the same perspective. Yeah. Um, he's an isolationist. He's, um, I believe, I believe I'll say this. I don't feel our, I don't feel we align on a lot of things in terms of family, community, yeah. relationships. Um, I think he's great and he motivates a lot of people. Yeah. We, we just, we just don't align on, on certain things. Yeah. Is he a savage? Absolutely. Yeah. Do I feel bad about his upbringing? hundred percent. Um, he's just, yeah. Well, I'll, I'll bring up we'll, something we'll, too. We'll leave it there. Yeah. No, I'll bring up something because I, I, I'm glad you said that and you're honest because for me, um, you know, people will compare me to people all the time. Right. Yeah. And they're like, you know, who are you competing with and everything else? And it's like, well, a lot of guys in this space, they don't have kids. They don't, mm -hmm. they're not Christian. They don't know God. They have different priorities in life. We're not aligned. Right. If, if their priority is to just make as much money as humanly possible, and that's how they define success, then I guess they're, they're beating me. Right. But if my priorities are very different yeah. in how I, you know, spread the gospel, how I raise my kids, how I actually enjoy life and enjoy all the you know, complexity and the, the uncertainty that life has to offer instead of being so single focused on just like one little avenue of life, then, you know, who am I actually comparing myself to? It's not really anyone, you know? So, yeah, I think, I think Goggins is competing against himself. I'm competing against myself. Correct. And at the end of the day, that's how it should be. You're competing against yourself and trying to become the best version of you can and bring as many people along with you. Yeah. And we're not, we're not even, we're, 
we're just very different, different people doing different things. Yeah. And I think it's important that people here in this realize that there are different people you need to align with for the message, right? Cause like, for instance, okay, we're going to go learn mental toughness. Like I'm going to devote to, to reading one or the other book, right? It's like, well, I'm going to go with James if I'm a family man and I'm trying to go do X, Y, Z. I'm going to go to Goggins if I want to get cussed out and, you know, like whatever. <laughs> yeah. Right. I can't. I can't and that do, is what I, it is. I can't do what he does and he can't do what I do. No. And, and we're, and, we're and very it, unique. It we're very different. different people. I've never met him. He's never met me. He probably didn't know who I am. And that's OK, <laughs> because I, I'm on my own journey and I'm totally satisfied and content with the relationships that I have, the journey that I've been on, the, the levels that I've been able to push. Um, I respect him, but we're very different. Yeah. No, and I think it's important to know is like people should not be envious or whatever of somebody else, right? Sure. And yeah. uh, it's just you're playing your own game at the end of the day. And unless you are directly competing, right? you know, in a fight, in a competition. I'll, I'll say this. I would get back in the ring if it was against David. You guys heard it here first. Maybe I'll have to start this boxing promotion. There you dude. go. Let's go. Yeah, like direct competition. We're the whole, same age. Hey, if we're playing golf that we're playing i'm gonna crush this guy like that's that's all that's going on in my head okay you and i will you and i will play golf and i'll fight goggins in the ring and then we'll win and then i'll fight whoever my rival is for sure and we'll just make it happen <laughs> <laughs> guys if you want to see that how about we'll do a tag team match <laughs> hey you know what we'll we'll have like the a and b you know two title matches and there we go <laughs> there we go the world's hardest and then the world's uh i don't know best hair or something but <laughs> you, uh, you'd have unbelievable hair <laughs> so whoever wants to challenge hair wise will go but uh, anyways, guys, <laughs> I'm a link to the Iron Cowboys books, his documentaries and everything else down below. Definitely go check it out. And uh, hopefully you were inspired by this podcast. I want to check you on the next one. Peace. We've got one house to yeah. live in for our whole lives. You can't short sell it. You can't sell it. You can't <laughs> foreclose on it. But you foreclose your dad. Our bodies. It's better that you take control of it and take care of it now before it's too late. Because when it's too late, your kidneys fail, your heart fail, like something